All right, good evening, everybody. I don't think there's anyone getting drinks, but they can wonder even when they do. Um, we'll get things started here. My name is Gareth Players. I'm the Government Relations Advisor at Active. Um, I'm not an urbanisation expert, but some of my best friends live in cities, so I'll be back and I'll be reviewing, but I'll be emceeing the panel a bit later. Um, there's an agenda on your, um, on your seat and the report that we're launching, um, so you can find out if the panellists are there and the, the brief um, agenda we've got planned for you tonight. But thank you for joining us. Um, Thank you for the Urban Steering Group, um, and uh, David will tell us more about that now. But I'm going to pass over to um, uh, David Sweeting as the co-convener of the Urban Steering Group. Um, Dean Crowley is here as well, the other co-convener, so thank you for your work here. Um, David will get the show ready. Crowley, I'll be back for the panel discussion. We've got our friend Sam listening through by Skype. Hopefully the tech works and we can keep him the whole evening, but um, he'll be turning his mic on and joining us for the discussion. A bit later. Thanks, Gary. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is David Sweeting. I'm the Urbanisation Advisor to Save the Children, also co chair for the, uh, the Urban Steering Committee. Before we start proceedings, I want to acknowledge the, the uh, Wundjeri people, the traditional owners of the, the coordination on which we are meeting. I pay my, my respects to their elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the launch of the Active Community of Practice uh, Policy Paper, titled Prosperous and Sustainable Cities for All, an Australian Development Agenda for Urbanisation in Asia Pacific. This is the first policy paper on this subject in the Australian international development sector. It's also appropriate to have this event in Melbourne, the most livable city six years in a row, according to the Economist World Livability Ranking, a ranking that is praised by cities in Northern Europe, Canada, Australasia. It's also a ranking that's overwhelmingly pri privileges stable, rich cities while ignoring the progress of poorer uh, urban centres and, and leaving the rich yet un un underperforming cities intact despite their enabling wealth. Also, if you're interested in the history of, of Melbourne, I can highly recommend Tim Plummery's book, The Birth of Melbourne. Uh, he, he, he writes, and I'll, I'll just paraphrase what he, what he writes here. All cities spring from twin fountain heads, the nature in which they are grounded, and the human enterprise that builds them. Nature works slowly and at times can be set on the beam ends by ecological disruptions. Yet she determines the fate of every living thing. Melbourne's history has been one of the dangerous human activity and unimaginable ecological catastrophe. Just over 170 years ago, this, this city did not exist. In its place was Hiram, a land beside the bay through which ran the sparkling river Barrett. This was a place of astonishing beauty and abundance, with deep roots in, in Godwana. But he, Flannery goes on to say, in contrast, there's a darker side to Melbourne. He talks about greed and disposition and incompetence. I'll give you an example. Melbourne's first Aboriginal mission was established in 1837, near what we know, now know as Royal Botanical Gardens. It lasted three years before the land became too valuable, and the people were forcibly moved to Narry Warren, Narry Warren in, in the southeast of Victoria. Narry Warren, Warren Reserve was a disaster for Aboriginal people. It was used as a recruitment depot for black police. The young men were armed and used to kill, dispossess, and arrest other Aboriginal people. The situation did not last long, and they were gathered up again and moved to Mordialic and then Warren and before the land was deemed too valuable again, and, and it was sold to the whites. So 170 years later, what have we learned? If we fast forward to 2016, 50% of populations live in cities, of which many are children and young people. One billion people live in slums. We have, we have no doubt the cities are getting bigger, younger, and more complicated than ever. Some of the greatest development challenges of the 21st century continue to be created in cities. As former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon had said, our struggle for global sustainability will be one lost in cities. So a paradigm shift is needed. And the world now agrees we have to act, and we have to act fast. So we, we need to look no further than Quito, Ecuador, where 50,000 people 
converged on, on this city to witness the historic adoption of the UN resolution for the new urban agenda at Habitat 3, the Conference for Housing and Sustainable Urban Development. Tonight, our experts in international urban development will discuss opportunities and challenges in cities and in our region. They'll bring their personal insights uh, from, from their agencies, but also personal experiences of working in, in different cities across Asia and Pacific. So I'd like to introduce to you our panel. To our left, we have, uh, in, the, in the middle, we have Kirsten McDonald, who leads Arab's international development team in Australasia. Kirsten has worked in cities since Arab joining, since joining Arab, most recently on the Rockefeller Foundation's Asian Cities Climate Change Resilience Network in Indonesia for the ADB on the use of incentives for disaster risk reduction in cities as a, and as a member of Arab and Plan International team that recently developed the Child Centered Urban Resilience Framework launched at Habitat 3. To the web, Kirsten, we have uh, Beth Sargent, who has 14 years experience working in international aid and development of public policy. Most recently, Beth has worked as head of policy and advocacy at the Australian Council for International Development. Beth has worked for aid and development NGOs in Timor Leste, Haiti, and Nepal, and has an economic policy advisor and, and as an economic policy advisor with the government in Australia and the UK. And I should note that Beth also was the, the principal author for this paper. Sam Kernigan, who you see on our screen, is joining us live from uh, from Singapore. Sam is the associate director for the 100 Resilient Cities. Uh, initiative funded by Rockefeller. Um, Sam is a qualified urban planner and economist who has been at the forefront of city resilience agenda for the past 10 years, including in Sri Lanka post Asian tsunami with New York after Hurricane Katrina, and as a program manager for the Rockefeller Foundation's Asia Cities Climate Change Resilience Network. We also have a, 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 a special guest, um, Dr. Brendan Barrett, research fellow at the UN Global Compact Cities Program hosted by RMIT University. Uh, Brendan is a visiting associate professor at the University of Tokyo as well. He's currently overseeing the Ethical Cities campaign and has developed an open online course on this topic, which was started in November. Previously, he was employed with the United Nations University and the United Nations Environment Program in Japan. So tonight's proceedings will be, uh, be moderated by Gary. But before before we end there, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight. Pat Tinkler uh, is the Director for Policy and Public Affairs at Save the Children Australia. Through this role, Matt is responsible for ensuring Save the Children's strong voice to vulnerable children with governments, government policymakers in the media and the Australian community. Previously, Matt has worked at, as the Chief of Staff to, to Bill Shorten in the federal government, overseeing a diverse range of portfolios covering topics from taxation law to not-for-profit regulation. Prior to this role, he was the Acting Executive Director for the Public Law Clearinghouse, an organisation that focuses on providing legal services to the most disadvantaged Australians. And Matt began his career as a corporate lawyer at Hunter Nelson. So I will be grateful if you welcome Matt to the <laughs> Thanks very much, David, and thanks, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for coming here tonight. It's great to be with you. Uh, I do like to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulma Nation, and any, any elders past and present, and honour them as one of the oldest continuing cultures on this earth. Um, when Habitat won the UN Conference on Housing and Sustainable Urban Development occurred in 1976, the proportion of the world's population living in urban communities was just 37.9%. By Habitat 2 in 1996, that figure had increased to 45.1%. And when Habitat 3 occurred in Ecuador last week, the world's urban population had climbed to 54.5%. By 2050, the world's urban population is expected to nearly double. So perhaps we need to have Habitat more often than every 20 years, is my first reflection. Um, because urbanisation is, as the, the Kyoto Declaration adopted last week, uh, pointed out, one of the 21st century's most transformative trends. And as David mentioned, you only have to look around the city we're in tonight to understand this. As well as being voted one of the most livable cities on earth for multiple years, Melbourne is officially Australia's fastest growing capital city, growing by 2.1% 
for 91,000 people per year, at least in 2014 15. That's on average 1,760 people per week new to Melbourne. Um, and Australia's capital cities account for around 83% of the nation's total population growth in the last financial year. Uh, and most of that growth is occurring now in suburban and inner city areas. And if you live in Melbourne, you, you feel less growth. Um, you can't add an MCG full of people every, every year and not feel it in some way. Um, whether it be the length of your commute from suburbs like Truganina or Tardy or Upper Point Cook, suburbs that none of us have ever heard of 10 years ago, or perhaps even heard of tonight. Um, or the trend for our trains to be stripped of seats and fitted with standing room only, or the number of bikes that are easily on the roads in the mornings when you commute in. Um, you feel this growth in population. And this inner city, as I mentioned, is routinely voted one of the most livable in the world. So imagine then the development challenges when rapid urban population growth uh, hits a developing nation whose infrastructure is already buckling at the seams. As populations descend on a city, so too do their economic needs and activities, their social and cultural expectations, and their environmental and humanitarian impacts as well. And these effects are far reaching across housing, you know, the basic services that we take for granted every day, like water, sanitation, energy, food security, health, um, education services, and of course, competition for a decent job that most people want just to allow to provide for their family. And this challenge I put to you tonight is none more pressing than here in the Asia Pacific, where some 2.38 billion people live in urban areas. Some 45 million people, or double our entire population here in Australia, are migrating to cities each year across the region. And as we've heard, the Asia Pacific is home to half of the world's slums, where almost a third of the region's population lives. So the face of uh, global poverty is changing, and its image is a city skyline. And I think that's why it's so important that we as development actors and practitioners contemplate both the challenges and opportunities that urbanisation brings. It was great to see some of these challenges recognised in the SDGs codified in SDGs last year through SDG number 11, the Cities Goal, uh, which strives to ensure that the cities and human settlements in this world are inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. And it's also great uh, to be here tonight to launch and dissect this fabulous report, Prosperous and Sustainable Cities for All, an Australian Development Agenda for Urbanisation <coughs> in the Asia Pacific. Uh, this report was a collaborative effort between some of our key players in the development sector and also by the Urban Steering Committee at the Backford Shelter Reference Group. I'd like to specifically acknowledge the contributions of Beth as the principal author, uh, Professor Brian Roberts and Leslie Roberts of Urban Frontiers, whose research underpinned the paper, and the review work completed probably by many of you in this room, and staff at Habitat for Humanity, World Vision, Save the Children, Ackford, and ARU. Now, the paper poses a number of critical questions. Um, for example, how do we, as uh, development agencies on the one hand take advantage of opportunities of urbanisation as an engine of sustained economic growth, of increased access to services and opportunities for a closer proximity for citizens to the decisions that affect their lives. And on the other hand, how do we improve the quality of life of urban inhabitants, including in slums and informal settlements, <laughs> and protect against environmental degradation that often follows? As the report eloquently <coughs> notes, the towns and cities are where the battle to end poverty and promote sustainable development will be won or lost. And I think the eight recommendations in the paper are a good place to start that battle. Now the recommendations range from timely reminders for NGOs to get ahead of the curve and put urbanisation front and centre in our programming and research strategies, and also recommendations to government to invest in urban programming and stimulate innovative solutions for urban challenges. And I think governments are thinking about these issues too. When our Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull addressed the UN General Assembly uh, a few weeks ago in New York, he noted that the tenor of our times has changed, accelerating with a pace and scale unprecedented in all of human history. And his development minister, who will address the ACRI conference this week, uh, Conchetta Ferranti Wells, said that, drawing on the Prime Minister's remarks, said, Traditional methods of aid delivery are no longer sufficient to address emerging development challenges and realise the aspirational goals articulated in the 2030 <coughs> Agenda for Sustainable Development. And to me, that's what the urbanisation agenda at its core is all about. 
how do we reimagine traditional development methods to fit a changing world and this changing face of poverty? And as urban practitioners and experts and uh, people engaged in development work generally, how do we ensure that urbanisation therefore remains front and centre in the development debate amidst all the competing issues and ideas uh, that we work on? In my view, at least, we need to ensure that we're talking in a language the government understands. And I think there's opportunities to use the lens of urbanisation to do this. Aid and development policy under the Turnbull and Abbott governments has seen a fairly acute contraction in both volume and geographic spread of uh, our aid program. But it's also seen a growing focus on collaboration with the private sector uh, through aid for trade. Uh, the need to innovate through initiatives like the Innovation Exchange and of course the geographic focus on Asia Pacific, where as you've heard it is, is really front and centre in the challenges of urbanisation. So I think there's some examples in this report that seek to leverage these characteristics and address some of these urban challenges. And uh, I'm being a little bit biased here, but there's a great initiative from Save Children in the paper, which you've probably heard of, called Colorol, an app that's been used in the slums of Durham, Bangladesh, to make access to essential services for inhabitants of those communities. But I think we need to continue to push these initiatives and make sure that they're not just examples or add-ons to our programming portfolio as NGOs, but they become mainstream approaches to programming. Uh, ways that we rethink our impact um, to suit the times and to, to suit uh, the trend of urbanisation in those communities. Evaluated for impact, importantly, and then funded at scale by governments uh, to increase that impact. And of course, we as development practitioners need to keep talking about it, to keep promoting the value of this cross cutting theme and making sure that it's something that government can't ignore. Uh, so by launching, I can declare the report officially launched <laughs> and say that you folk being in this room are certainly playing your part and as perhaps uh, preaching to the converted, but um, we need to continue this conversation and it's fantastic to have a group of experts in the room to help dissect these challenges now and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, yeah, as a, as a non-urban expert like me, that was... Um, <laughs> Pretty insightful. I think you situated it well in the, in, the, in the context of ETA and what's going on globally. But also ask the question as, as your role as to how can how can government come to the party here? Um, left with a good question around how can how can innovation specifically address urban poverty? So we might get to that at the end. But um, now we're over to the to the experts. I'm, I'm going to um, Sam, if you could pop your pop your mic on. Um, hopefully the, the audio works well. We've got a couple of questions that, that I'll sort of facilitate. I'll jump to Sam first. I'm not sure if he can hear the, the full discussion there, but we'll See what Sam has to say, have a bit of a discussion, and then I'll keep an eye on the clock and open up to, to the audience, because it'd be great to, to have, a, have, a, have a conversation in the room here. So, um, firstly, uh, Sam and Pavel, um, why are cities so challenging <coughs> to work in? Um, governments, NGOs, research institutes, and private companies struggle to work in cities. Why are they so different? Um, why is new thinking, new approaches, new financing mechanisms needed for urban programming? <coughs> Sam? Hi guys, I hope you hear me okay. Yes. Great, so you can imagine that uh, answering that question in one minute is quite challenging. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and set it up, I guess. So I'm, there are a couple of things. One, uh, working in cities requires you to work potentially at multiple scales. So whether that's at the individual level, the community level, the district level, the city level, the peri-urban level, or at the regional level, the, the kind of um, hinter, hinterlands that cities rely on for their, for their operation. W within that sort of multiple scales, you have spatial diversity. So thinking about any cities that you're, that you're aware of in the, in the developing world or um, in the developed, those, those cities are not um, ubiquitous in terms of how people are experiencing uh, the delivery of urban systems, delivery of um, quality of life across those cities. It's, uh, it's often unequal, but it's all, always different. I think the third thing is, is cities operate as systems. I mean, we can't get away from this. So when we're thinking about what a system means, we're talking about the delivery of water, uh, health, energy, food, all of those things. And the way in which those systems occur require <laughs> the institutions, the kind of governance and the rules and regulations that enable delivery of those um, of 
those systems, the required ecosystems that rely, that, that provide, whether it's the water or the air quality or the, or the land, uh, the knowledge and the information, whether that's through a market or whether that's through sharing information, and also the infrastructure. And so if you think about the delivery of any system, it requires at least all those four things to be working together. And as cities grow and as they become more complex and globally connected, we need to recognise that those systems have the potential to fail and they have the potential to fail in ways that we can't predict. So that's where the kind of uncertainty agenda of, of uh, urbanisation and the kind of delivery of basic needs as well as the kind of growth and um, achievement of sort of uh, prosperous and livable cities becomes challenged by this kind of complexity and globalisation. So I'm going to leave it there as a, a kind of starter for 10, I suppose. Um, very complex environments in which to work and I think... Uh, as, as was mentioned in the kind of opening address, the role of, of technology is becoming, um, is making cities increasingly complex. It's also solving some problems, but the potential for, uh, uh, and opportunity is kind of embedded in that kind of growing complexity. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, Sam. So, yeah, cities are complex systems. We'll come back to what are some of the solutions, but I'll jump over to the panel in the house here. Um, anything to add to that? Why are cities so hard to work in? Why, why is it difficult? Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me. This is Brendan. Um, I'm actually thinking of it from the uh, city's point of view. Um, you could actually... Yeah, if we, if we think of it from the city's point of view, um, first of all, you shouldn't uh, present them as one package, that they're all the same. Um, cities like uh, Jakarta, um, Shanghai, they what we think of as mega cities. And they generally have very large number of staff and resources and quite capable of uh, taking care of themselves. And they also seem to be the cities that participate in uh, many of these global networks like the uh, 100 Resilient Cities or uh, ICLE or whatever. Um, then there's a second tier of, of about 600 cities around the world that are kind of like the dynamos of the global economy right now. And, uh, but that's likely to, to change in the future because we have this smaller, this, this sorry, bigger group of thousands of cities um, with probably around less than a million population. And I think those are the cities that are actually really struggling. Yeah, because they have, uh, they have quite small staff, they have um, rapid population growth, rapid economic growth, all these uh, uh, challenges that they're facing. And they also have difficulty dealing with all the different agencies who want to work in their city. So whether that's the World Bank or uh, UN Habitat or uh, you know, World Vision or whoever, it's very challenging for them to actually be able to coordinate and, and, and manage those relationships. So I think if you, if you look at that, that perspective, it's that tier of cities that actually probably need the most help. I think we'll leave the mic. It's probably a bit distracting this time. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'll feel like sad if you can't hear anything. Person, David, any that? Um, yeah, well, it's, there's so much to add, I guess, but I'll, I'll focus on... We'll, we'll come to the good news, so don't get, don't get too demoralised <laughs> yeah. by the challenge. Well, the, I think there's the issue of informality in, in Asian cities is, is prevalent. Uh, something that we're not familiar with, perhaps in Australia, we, we don't... Informality does exist in Australia. Um, example is when businesses operate cash only, that's a form of informality. But in Asia, informality is is the dominant economy. It's just not captured in GDP growth. Um, and so if we look at that, markets, housing, even local governments have around informality, I think there, there lies the potential solution. I'll, I'll leave it as, the, as the, the, uh, another discussion. Um, but also, if you're looking at informality, from the perspective of a government, it's, it's, most governments look at it as a hindrance. Um, you may disagree on the panel, but I, I, I haven't seen a government that's been sympathetic to a slum for a prolonged period of time. Even <laughs> the most famous slum in, in all of Asia, which is Dharabi, is now earmarked for redevelopment. Uh, Dharabi produces, I can't quote direct, directly, but um, a very high proportion of GDP growth in Mumbai. So if you if you're a local government and you're you're trying to address some of these issues, your first instinct is to to evict or 
I guess I was mentioning before, dispossess people of their land and their house. <coughs> and, and this, is a, this is a critical issue for, for us. And do you have a piece in the conversation at the moment that speaks to this? I do. You'd yes. like to read more? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's more. Um, I think from our perspective, one of the challenges, and certainly um, we're learning that this is a challenge for lots of development actors, um, the likes of, say, the children and so on, is, is that we're dealing with the built environment, built stuff, and, and um, development uh, actors like the INGOs are not necessarily experts in the built stuff, <coughs> but, but you need to understand how the process of designing, you know, planning, designing, delivering, and how that, uh, and then maintaining how that infrastructure um, fails. I think Sam raised the point. There's, uh, so there's that interaction with, with the built, the built stuff that's that's so important. And I think that, that there is expertise that's that's needed to reach the table. And I think that ties into this idea of, you know, there's a need to work in a different way in a multi use sectoral way and, and that's not a familiar way of working for most of us. We, we um, mostly work in uh, singular disciplinary ways, we, you know, not, in, not, not in the same way that's needed in order to address these sort of complex issues um, that, 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 that we face in regards to, to cities. Yeah, just to add quickly, and actually, I'm not an urbanisation expert, but I had great research and uh, colleagues to work with in writing this paper. Um, but I was actually writing it from Kathmandu, which really brought home the sort of challenges and issues around urbanisation. I think just to, to add to the points around um, the systems approach as well, and I think for development sector as well, to also be thinking about the linkages between the rural and urban areas as well. Um, uh, so with a lot of the, the population movement we're seeing to urban areas is coming from, from rural areas. So I think the, the challenge is about um, trying to uh, improve quality of life and, and the like in urban areas, um, but also as the development sector, the continuing need to be working in um, rural areas to try and improve opportunities and quality of life there as a way to um, you know, curb um, urbanisation. Thanks, Ben. So, so the challenge is it sounds like it's a complex system. Informality is a challenge. There are multi-tiers you need to work through and dealing with the built environment. And Kirsten and Beth were sort of, sort of forward around to answering question number two, which is about what are the solutions. So what are people doing about it? How, what are international development agencies specifically doing about it? How are they working successfully in cities? I'll jump to Sam. Do you want to have a go at that question? What's, what's the good news? How long do I have for this one? <laughs> Two minutes. So, uh, two minutes. So, um, I, I guess there's a lot that people can read about the work that the Rockefeller Foundation did with the agency's climate network. And to Brendan's point, that was focused on cities between 50,000 and a million people across South and Southeast Asia. And that was really an experiment <laughs> about how to work in cities that were um, at the intersection of, of climate change risk, uh, rapid urbanisation, and increasing poverty. And so there's a lot that was kind of learned from that, and I guess the um, I guess the mandate of the 100 resilient cities is is to learn from from that experience, the sort of eight years and 60 million dollars the Rockefeller invested in in that uh, experiment, if you like, and to try and scale that out to to 100 cities around the world. So um, apologies if there's a little bit of a plug, but it, it really does answer the question in terms of how we how we are currently working in a, in a way that we think is, um, we're not going to claim success yet, but certainly is, is kind of learning those lessons. So the first the first one is really around the appointment of uh, what we call a Chief Resilience Officer in each of the cities around the world that we're working in. So we provide funding to the city to employ somebody to coordinate the, um, the strategy development within that city. So working with all the stakeholders in that city uh, to understand vulnerability, etc., go through the process. But that person is employed by the city. Yes, we provide the funding, but that person is employed by the city. They have a two-year remit, and a part of their kind of terms of reference is to work out ways of seeking and identifying the funding to enable their role to continue, and not just their role, but also the office that's supporting them. Um, so, for example, in uh, we have a similar example in, in New Orleans and in Samaria. Two years of funding provided to those cities. The chief resilience officer is now being institutionalised within that city, i.e., they've recognised the role that that person is playing. So I think that's one that's 
one component. And yes, we're providing the kind of strategy support, if you like, the kind of uh, grunt behind that chief resilience officer, not just letting him or her go on their own. But, but, but embedding that that, um, that person within the city rather than being an external funder, donor, international aid organisation just coming in and expecting the city to kind of jump um, without the without the resources or, or embedding within the city. Uh, the second thing um, is, a, is around network and what we just what we found from the Asian Cities Climate Change Resilience Network and, and we're sort of doubling down on that with 100 resilient cities is, is that cities... Um, can really learn both from success, which is great, but also from failure. And they take a lot of comfort from other cities who are struggling to address all the multiple challenges that they've, they've got in front of them, whether they're social, economic or environmental, uh, and to put those into um, a frame or a strategy or a document or a, or a communication strategy even as to how they're going to address those or which ones are the most important and to communicate that politically but also with uh, you know, community stakeholders. And so there's a lot of learning and that happens across scales. So mega cities, uh, smaller cities, second from mega cities and vice versa. Developed cities are learning from developing and vice versa. And cities that are facing earthquake or other kind of physical stresses, uh, physical shocks, are learning from cities that have, that have responded to uh, social or economic kind of stresses. So that kind of network um, component is really important if, if done well. And I guess the, the network is between, that we're creating is between cities, but it's also between chief resilience officers and it's between mayors. So there's lots of levels at which the learning about success and about failure is, is happening because we're not pretending we have the answers to this and the cities aren't really pretending they've got the answers to it either. Um, and the third one, if I can add quickly, and again, this is all a big, I'm not, as I said, I'm not preaching we've got the answers. We're, this is a, a, a lot of experimentation going, but the third one is around the, the, kind of the private sector and a not-for-profit platform that, that 100 Resilient Cities is trying to put together, which is, um, we've got about 95 partners from Theolia and Microsoft uh, and Swiss, Save the Children, um, World Bank uh, organisation in providing their own services to cities but are still learning how to do that and so the cities are interested in benefiting from whether it's learning about cyber um, cyber threats with Microsoft or whether it's more about you know child-centered urban resilience with save the children there's a whole lot that cities are still learning to do and the partners whether they're private sector or not-for-profit are also still learning how to work with cities so there's a big kind of um, opportunity there I think to kind of broker relationships and broker opportunities to learn and then share those experiences so that yeah so that businesses and, and not for profits are learning how to work with cities but also those cities are benefiting from um, from that engagement. Again I'll probably talk too much but there's sort of some of the things that are that, that we're kind of learning and seeing in terms of um, working with cities in this context. Great thank you Sam. So for, for complex problems we need to network and we need to share thinking and then embed that into strategy for cities. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the CRO thing is really about capacity. It's about enabling the city to build capacity to solve its own problems rather than relying on external agencies to come and find solutions, which is uh, proven not to work. <laughs> and to contextualise a bit, like Sydney and Melbourne are part of the 100 resilient cities and have CROs? So Sydney and, Sydney and Melbourne, yes. And then in uh, Indonesia, we have Semarang in Central Java and Jakarta. Uh, and then uh, Cantor and Da Nang, Vietnam, uh, Bang Bangkok in Thailand, uh, in India, Pune, Chennai, Jaipur, Surat. Uh, so there's uh, about 25 cities across Asia Pacific and, and just sort of 30, 30 odd countries around the world. Wow. Thank you, Sam. So it sounds like there's some good work happening through 100 resilient cities. Um, there's other good work happening. There are other, there are other solutions. There are other things that are, that are going well. Um, over to the experts. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I think um, following on from Keto, um, one of the big questions that's going to come out is actually how we can take this non-mandatory plan and turn it into real concrete action. And I think uh, one key aspect of that is the resources, resources being made available to cities. Um, one of the things that actually is included in the document is the fact that um, 
UN habitat alone will not be responsible for doing this, that it actually requires a one United Nations uh, approach, but also means um, collaborating with other international entities, um, including the World Bank. And there is actually discussion going on about setting up a special funding facility to uh, essentially support the UN's action in this area. And it's interesting, in the studies that they did in preparation for Quito, they actually found out that right now uh, we're spending something like $120 billion a year on international aid, but it's not necessarily focused on cities. And of the money that goes through the UN's trust fund, they set up trust funds focusing on different issues like energy, water, and so on. Only $250 million is currently going towards urban uh, related activities. So what they're actually thinking now is whether they can actually use Quito as a way to actually encourage more countries to donate the overseas development resources through the funds, through the UN, through the World Bank, and into cities. They haven't figured out exactly how they'll do that, but I think it would be a very effective mechanism if they could go directly to the cities. But as you know, often it goes through the national government before, and they decide where it gets spent. But I think it would be great if you could actually have a financial mechanism that was able to pump resources into cities and, and maybe have a multi-agency approach around those. <laughs> if something came out like that from Quito, I think that would be a fantastic step forward. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking some probably active members are culpable in that as well because the weird intermediary is getting in the way there as well. And part of our conference is looking at sort of the future development agenda that could be the way where... Yes, yeah, so it's, it's not about yeah. Australia going it alone, but Australia are actually working with those other international partners to make sure Australian aid can be spent most effectively. And if the priority was, for instance, to get it into cities in Asia Pacific, then it would be a multilateral process. Beth, you started talking about um, rural and urban linkages. Any other solutions? Yeah, and I guess to speak to some of the recommendations in the paper, which um, are these ideas around how we can work more successfully from an urban perspective. So firstly, around the need for a strategic approach um, so the need for aid and development actors, if they're in this space, to, to develop urban strategies um, that uh, respond to community need, um, but also thinking about the, the value add um, of that, that, that agency. Um, so that's one of the key recommendations in the report. Um, and for these strategies to be long-term, I mean, we've talked about the sort of complexity of cities and the fact that um, you're um, working in places that have um, been there for, for hundreds of years, so there's a, um, you know, it's, yeah, there's a, because of that complexity, um, there needs to be sort of a, a longer term approach to this work. Um, I think the second thing, and picking up on the um, point by Sam around the sort of um, need for systems thinking, um, so for um, programs within urbanisation to take an integrated approach. Um, if we're thinking about economic development, um, we need to be thinking about transport, infrastructure, um, education opportunities and the like. So that is a, a, a different way in terms of programming. Um, and I think thirdly, um, the need to think about a beyond aid approach. So as we've heard, um, aid programs can be absolutely essential, um, but it's also thinking about um, the policy setting, so supporting um, developing countries around um, policy settings for cities, so around urban planning, environmental management, um, social welfare, um, but also as a, you know, I think as Australia for the Australian government, thinking about um, how our policy settings can impact on developing countries and urban settings, be that in um, climate change, trade investment. Um, lastly, I think really key around, um, and we've been hearing quite a bit around partnership and collaboration. Um, so I think urbanisation really provides an opportunity for strong partnership across different sectors, there's the vital role of different levels of government, the real key role of the private sector and the expertise, um, but also of NGOs and civil society, um, ensuring communities um, uh, represented and their, their rights are paramount. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think really exciting space for partnership and collaboration, and that's vital to success. Um, and so one of the key recommendations as well is the establishment of the uh, Australian Urban Sustainable Development Forum to bring different actors together and to 
I'd like to jump to the audience, but we'll probably quickly go to Kirsten and David. Can you answer that question? Um, and thinking about why is why is this report important as well, and what's the what's some of the work your agency is doing? I mean, I just I want to pick up on on, on this point. I mean, we've talked a bit about cross sectoral working um, being needed, and I think that the private sector. Not I think we need to keep in mind that the private sector, and, and, and I'm representing the private sector here, um, is that we don't just have expertise; we also have a stake. So I think it's important to, to understand that and to um, leverage that the stake that the private sector has in in um, more you know cities that function and livable, sustainable, and, and so on. And I think that will come to the fore as we start to work through um, the sustainable development goal, the work towards the sustainable development goals, um, the new agenda, and so on. But I think fundamentally, uh, the private sector needs to be seen as having an equal stake in this. Um, and, and of course, yes, being a, a source of expertise, which is the way you know, we work in that way, we provide our expertise or make available our expertise, I think. And, and um, some early analysis of, of Quinto was that the private sector was notably absent. Yeah, mm -hmm. We were there. Um, <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah, that's my David. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree with all the panel's uh, suggestions. Uh, probably one thing to add um, is to recognise seems to be a diminishing role of NGOs in this space, um, but some of the most effective work I've seen are by NGOs and quasi-NGOs, and I constantly refer back to this program, but the housing program in Thailand is by far and away the best housing program I've ever seen for slum communities, and it, it, it was from national government down to down to city government. Um, it, it, it's called the Ban Man Kong Housing Program, and the Thai government actually set up a quasi-NGO Facility and, find, and, and, and funding mechanism to to help upgrade slum communities. So they they weren't focused on uh, relocation unless they were located in hazardous areas. Um, but that yeah, that program in itself has, has received a, a lot of attention, of, uh, accolades, and and also there's a lot of publication and research out there to, to demonstrate a a whole government approach, but led by the city government. I'm going to quickly check with my colleague at the back. So are we still on for a seven o'clock hard finish? Yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. <laughs> I'd like to give some time for questions here um, and probably finish with a closing statement from the panelists and, and from Sam. But um, Mike had a hand in the report and did some um, some ruthless uh, culling, but he's quite across. Mike is from uh, World Vision. Um, you got a question to the panelists? Yeah, well, I suppose um, it's on that, the role of the NGO moving forward. Uh, so World Vision is about to roll out um, radio networked and mobile connected fire alarms into slums in, in Dhaka. Um, but we've worked into the three year project that in the third year our aim is to pass it on to a private insurance provider in the form of a, a micro um, insurance product. I was wondering where do you see like what does the relationship between the NGO space and the private sector, and especially around sort of technology and innovation, um, what does that look like as we move ahead? Um, well, I know Matt mentioned one of our projects in Bangladesh. It's, it's very much working in a similar space of technology um, with a view of working with the private sector. Um, and we also partner with the University of Western Sydney. But I, I just generally take a step back, I would suggest that partnerships inevitably de-risk a project. Like if you go in a, into one of these projects alone, you, you're, you're um, absorbing all the risk. And, and one of the advantages <coughs> of a private-public kind of partnership like you're describing is de-risking it. And the NGO can absorb a certain degree of risk that perhaps a, a private company couldn't. So what World Vision is doing or what Save the Children is doing is really um, testing an innovation um, in a in a context that a, a private company wouldn't be able to spend their time, nor would they have any interest due to high costs or, or, or risk. Um, and it's through that testing on market, essentially, um, that a private company may want to get on board with an NGO. And I, I, I think perhaps some of the discussion sort of I've had in the past with private sector engagement is about NGOs reaching out and getting funding. But actually, no. The, the really, the, the real partnership is about uh, collaborating, or you know, dare I say, shared value. But um, 
developing these projects together uh, in, in, a, in a way that um, allows for flexibility from both sides and, uh, you know, and I'm saying just reducing that, that kind of risk. Can I, can I add to that? I, I mean, I think from a private sector perspective, I would say what NGOs um, have that we don't have um, and we uh, yet we want to impact um, is access, is access to communities, the most vulnerable communities. We don't have access. Uh, we would love to, but we, we want to also have impact. I mean, that's a mandate that's top-down driven in our organisation. So we, um, and, and our mission is to shape a better world. So we, we need to have access to, uh, and we need to work with NGOs. I mean, that's just a very simple example from, from the private sector perspective. And that's, that is a, a shared, you know, an example of shared value um, where there's complementary, um, there's different needs and, 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 and we can benefit. Uh, and I think that it's finding those opportunities is what we need to do in order to engage in private sector. I, mean, I think Arabs is a unique organisation. We're not we um, we consider ourselves atypical um, of, of, of the private sector. But but the fact is we need to mobilise and be able to, to leverage those those uh, interests of the private sector um, and and engage in those partnerships. I think. Uh, I that it's probably probably worth noting this report just was was. Um, created by the Urban Shelter Group, but that's rebranded as ACTA's Urban Community of Practice. We had some working groups that are now communities of practice, and part of that community of practice framework is that there are non-members like private organisations like Arab who can come on board, so... Um, and provide technical advice. Yeah, so, so you're part of the private community. <laughs> Brenda, you've had experience in private and public sector. What is, what is your experience, or what does the research say about the role of the NGO space in the private sector? I haven't really done much on the ground, though. That's the, the main issue as in I mean world vision save the children you actually go into the community and uh, set up these projects my my as you, my, my experience has been up there in the clouds with the with the UN I'm afraid and so I don't really have that uh, really that much to say on that point so. I mean, one thing I, I'd just like to add um, I mean DFAT as innovation exchange has really been set up to to pioneer new ways of, to bring aid or and, and part of that involves engaging with the private sector, and and so there's you know there is an acknowledgement of the of the benefit, and there is support from, from the government of, of different approaches. So there is an opportunity to take advantage of their um, thinking about new ways of, 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 of doing aid. I want to say without putting you on the spot, but Mark Lucy's from Deep Back here. Um, are you in the innovation side or climate? Uh, no. No beanbags in the area, are we? <laughs> um, do you want to speak to what, is, what does this conversation sound like from a deeper point? Yeah, of? sure. Um, first of all, just to say thanks to ACFID and its members. We've um, not me personally, but have some, some quality dialogue um, with um, <coughs> some people in this room. Um, I think it's a slow moving beast um, in, in terms of how we're coming to think about the organisation, uh, but we, we are having that discussion. And the fact that ACFED is talking about it and producing papers like this is really helpful. Um, I think that all of these ideas are great and I think the policy case is well made. Um, it's hard, um, I think Matt mentioned, the constrained environment. Um, you've got a whole range of priority sectors um, that have been cut over the past few years, and so part of the difficulty is in framing this as something that we could um, address in a meaningful way, uh, but, but basically not take more money away from existing priorities. So that's that's one of the key um, uh, issues I think that we're, we're looking at moving forward. We don't just want to issue an organisation strategy, for example, without putting anything else behind it. Um, but we would like to see you issue <laughs> I think that's a recommendation. <laughs> um, I, I guess, yeah, so that, I mean, I, I was wondering to, if, if I could pose a, maybe a couple of questions. Um, in your respective organisations, um, we many of them work in many sectors. We've talked about the cross-sectoral approach. Has that been an issue, um, trying to get this on the radar of, of people that already have a very busy schedule? And for something like urbanisation as well, to do it effectively, presumably you're going to need to involve almost everyone in your organisation, climate change, um, water and sanitation, 
you know, infrastructure is, is really quite, quite broad. So any any challenges or, or, um, or good news stories on that regard. And and then secondly, um, just as I said before, there's, there's a policy case that's been well made over some years now, I think, to, to work in this space. Um, and the public service has a role to look at that and to, to prepare advice to government, but ultimately, resourcing this is a government decision. And so any um, any experience of the panel members or, or others in sort of how to generate political will, I guess, um, is, is what I'm getting at. Um, I'm not aware, I'm, I'm not uh, terribly across this issue, but I'm not aware of any parliamentary friendship groups or um, politicians that have been particularly vocal about it in the same way that you get them all vocal about issues like polio and, and advocating funding for the global funds and things like that. So, um, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, Sam, I want to bring you into the conversation. I think the first bit of the question, probably Beth could answer that one. But Sam, how do you generate political will? Did you hear that question from Mark? Uh, I did. I did it. <laughs> but that's okay. I was getting about fifty percent of it. Um, I mean, it's it's really pretty really important. Obviously, com component of the um, engagement that. We've been having in, in cities. I guess I guess one of the ways uh, this goes back both to the Asian Cities Climate Change Resilience Network and, and the work that, that we're doing is you've got to do you to really demonstrate you know real success or real progress on the ground. Um, you know mayors mayors love you know signing up to to, to things and getting plaques and, and being part of international networks, but the political will is not generated unless you're actually demonstrating measurable change on the ground. And I and I think that's really where. Um, measurable change and, and also access to knowledge and, and experience and, and even potentially finance uh, and funding that they're not otherwise able to, to get access to. Um, so I think that, that knowledge component, I think I've talked about that, I think that's really, that's a really important component. I think um, the, the funding and financing bit, which Brendan talked to a little bit, have helping cities to kind of uh, about uh, the challenges they're facing you know, and accessing kind of that funding, whether it's from international institutions or from, from their own national government. Um, but the real thing is actually demonstrating that, that change on the ground. And I think that's, um, you know, one of the challenges that the, you know, DFAT and other bilateral and multilateral agencies have is that they have to engage at national level because that's the, the relationship that countries have between each other. Um, the opportunity that we have is to really try and build examples on the ground and, and to um, scale other projects that are happening on the ground so that there's um, both the, the political will built at the city level, so whether it's councillors or mayors or others are, are, are getting behind the, the need to invest in sustainable, resilient urbanise, you know, urbanise, urbanisation and, and infrastructure, but also that that momentum carries through <laughs> to other cities, so in a peer-to-peer -peer sort of way, but also up to that national level where um, policy makers are, you know, Places like Indonesia, where the national policy de determines a lot of where the funding goes, and a lot of the way in which urbanisation and urban development happens. There's, a, there's examples and there's practice that's happening on the ground that can influence that national policy and then get some flow back down. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. There's lots of examples. That's the kind of. Thank you, Sam. I, I'd say, I'd say pitch. people should come talk to you in the drink section afterwards, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> We've probably got two minutes, one minute left. Um, Beth, the question around um, from, from Mark about how do you get everyone on board and are there examples in other sectors? Or? Yeah, so I think the question is more about um, how organisations that do have an urban focus are bringing it all together. So actually, David or um, Kirsten might be the best place. But just quickly on the political will, just two quick points. I think it's um, building the network in Australia first um, to show that there is real interest and focus on this issue. So um, I think coming together. Um, private sector actors, NGOs, academia and the like, to show that this is a real issue of concern. And secondly, and something the paper tries to do is framing it that um, this issue is absolutely in Australia's interest as well as the important to act from a moral perspective. So the need to have a um, uh, Asia Pacific region in which to trade and invest and, and, and a secure region and the like. So the, the paper tries to do that as well. Um, so that if we're speaking to politicians, we can say it's, um, yeah, it's, it's also in Australia's interest to do this work. But, you guys might be the best person to speak. I mean, I can easily answer that 
question, I guess, is that cities are one of our priority areas for Arab globally. Um, so we're investing in, in that. We organize around cities. Um, we invest in research and building our own knowledge and, and sharing and disseminating that knowledge, um, which includes our contribution to this piece of work. Uh, so it is a priority. It's one of our three priority areas globally. So cities are important for us in the organization. Briefly, yeah. Yeah, um, I think one other thing to acknowledge uh, <coughs> is the urgency around this. So if you think about the SDGs, we've got like 14 years left. Um, you think about the, I mean, if we want to meet the targets, uh, if you think about the new urban agenda, we want to get moving quickly. If you think about the Paris Agreement and when emissions need to be and start declining, we have to go quickly. So the great news is there are lots of tools out there that can really help uh, cities do their analysis and come up with their strategies and identify their priorities and make their plans and projects. It's possible to do that, but to do that very easily, but they may be not aware of it. And I think that's where uh, Australian institutions can play a key role in getting that information to them, getting and introducing the tools, helping them, helping them develop the strategies, even monitoring and evaluation. There's a lot of work that. But we have to get a move on. Maybe, uh, the way that Save the Children has, has uh, tried to encourage uh, urbanisation in the organisation, probably three areas of highlight. One is uh, revisiting our investment strategy. Um, we did a global study of where our programming funding, all, all funding, um, no matter what donor, and it turned out that 87% of our funding goes to rural place locations. Um, when you look at the sheer population sizes and where they're located, that the investment doesn't make sense. So that's a, it's a strong argument for us to change that, or at least lobby our donors to, to, to look, look at urban areas more. Um, developing tools for contextual analysis, I think Brendan touched on that, so, and many agencies are starting to pick this up, but we need to, we need to front end our designs with strong contextual analysis of cities or locations within cities at, at the very least. And that's taking a sort of a political economy view of, of those locations. So the State of Children, again, is working on these tools um, to, to aid our, our countries uh, in, in designing new programs. Um, and then finally, providing technical assistance. Um, I, I, I can't understand how much technical assistance is needed. Um, you've got some experts up here on, on the panel. Um, and companies like Arab are actually blessed with technical assistance from you know, engineers, architects and planners and so on. Um, but also in the social side, you, you, need, a, you need economists, you, you need sociologists at times, it's, it's having a selection of technical assistance depending on your program. And, and you don't necessarily have to house them in your organisation. They, they exist, Australia has many of them around there. It's, it's, it's just developing this network like, um, uh, like Beth was mentioning. I feel a little bit like Tony Jones because we just came to the, the meat of the conversation and now we need to stop because Lake Line is coming up. Um, <laughs> we don't have Lake Line, we've got something better, we've got some drinks and some food arriving. So I think we'll finish up here. Won't you please put your hands together to thank you for the panel. Thank you, thank you to Matt Tinkler for that keynote speech. It's, 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 thank you to Sam for dialing in from Singapore. And I'm, I think I think um, and again, it's sort of a bit of a, a bit of a pun to, to Megan and David and their work in the new urban community practice. If you would like to get involved, please find them out and we'll sign you up. You can stay seated, you can get a beverage, you can keep the conversation going. We're going to have a bit of a scene change and open the door and get some food in here. So thank you. Everybody.